Um, so thank you. Good morning again. Um, we're going to switch now from the basic anatomy principles to the basic physics principles. Um, so bear with me, uh, and I'll try to take you gently through the physics. Um, and the first thing to show you, and I won't be showing lots of complicated equations. This is the most complicated equation that I should be showing you. Um, is what determines how sound travels in the body. Ultrasound is sound above the frequency of human hearing. And in um, uh, medical ultrasound, we use frequencies in the range of megahertz, 1 to 10 megahertz usually, sometimes higher if we want higher resolution. And sound is a pressure wave that travels um, and the pressure as it travels changes the density of the wave. And this is shown in a kind of computer model here that you see uh, that shows as that pressure wave travels, the small elements of the medium get compressed, the density changes. And this little black uh, cube that's shaded here, as the sound wave passes, you can see it compress and change in volume and then expand again as the sound wave passes on. Now, that speed of which those density and pressure variations pass through the tissue along this beam is determined by two properties, the density of the tissue um, and also uh, the compressibility of the tissue, the amount by which the volume changes for a given change in pressure determines that coefficient. And the square root of the ratio of these two determines how fast the sound travels. So the higher um, this um, coefficient, the faster the sound, the more dense the speed, uh, the, the more dense the tissue, the lower the speed. Um, and we'll come back to that equation in a moment when we talk about how the speed varies for different types of tissues. It is important because there's fat and other tissues in the breast and that changes the speed of sound because these different tissues have different values for these properties. And I mentioned just now frequency. That is the number of pressure oscillations per second and it's measured in units of hertz or cycles per second. One hertz is one cycle per second. And our diagnostic frequencies for ultrasound are usually in the range of 2 megahertz up to 20 megahertz. The speed and the frequency are related to each other because the speed is equal to the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. And the wavelength is the distance between any two points on the wave cycles. So for example, the distance between two compression parts where the density is high here and here would be a wavelength. But could you, you could also measure it between two rarefraction points where the density is low between here and here. It would be the same value. So the speed equals the frequency times the wavelength. That's a useful simple equation to remember. And both of those equations, speed equals frequency multiplied by wavelength, and the speed is determined by the compressibility and the density are repeated here. Now, compressibility and density are properties of the tissue, the medium. And therefore, the speed is a property of the medium as well. But frequency is controlled by us, and we set that with the transducer that we choose. And therefore, the wavelength that we get is a property of the medium, given the frequency that we've chosen. Now, different speeds for different tissues are shown here, muscle, liver, water, fat, lung, and air. And you can see that fat typically is the only solid soft tissue that has a speed of sound lower than water. And all of the others, just two examples here, liver and muscle, but all of the other tissues um, 
that a non-fatty tends to have a speed of sound that are higher than water. And this will have consequences that I'll explain later. It relates to the uh, refraction of the wave, an aberration of the wave as it travels through tissues that consist of fat and other tissues. And therefore that's important for the breast. You can see that from this equation, the wavelength is inversely proportional to the frequency. If we just rearrange this, um, you can see that the wavelength is inversely related to the frequency. The higher the frequency, the longer the wavelength. And we will see later that's important for resolution. It's why higher frequencies give you better resolution because smaller wavelengths can be focused more easily. But more immediately, if frequency is 3 to 10 megahertz, then the wavelength is of the order of 0.5 to 0.1 millimeters. That's the sort of size of the wavelength, and that's therefore the kind of resolution that we will get with these different wavelengths. So the higher the frequency, the smaller the wavelength, and this allows narrower sound beams and better resolution. How do we form ultrasound images? Well, real-time ultrasound imaging presents on the screen as a sequence or a movie of individual image frames. One image frame consists of a number of discrete image lines, each of which is, contains the ultrasound echoes that are put on the display that display the tissue anatomy. The more independent lines, the better the image appearance, that is, the more tissue detail can be displayed. And due to the speed of propagation of ultrasound, there is a limit to the combination of imaging depth, the number of lines, and the frame rate. And that relationship is shown on this slide. Essentially, when you transmit a sound pulse into the tissue, it has to travel to the depth of interest where it's going to get reflected, and then you have to wait for that reflection to come back before you can display the echoes. So the total travel time to that depth and back again is what determines the line rate. And when it comes back from that deepest region that you're interested in, then you can send out another pulse for another image line that's adjacent, and you won't get any confusion if you wait that time, if you don't wait that time, then there will be confusion over where the echoes came from and which pulse they came from. So that limits the line rate. And the time to get to a depth and back again is determined by the speed of sound. And approximately, for most tissues, the speed of sound is about 15, 14 meters per second. And for one centimeter depth of tissue, it would take 6.5 microseconds to travel at that speed. But we have to wait for go and come back again. So it's twice that, and that's 13 microseconds. So the time to wait for one image line is the depth D multiplied by 13, if D is in centimeters. And that will be the total time for one image line then we need to multiply that by the number of lines in the image. And that will give us the total frame rate, um, the total time to acquire one frame, will be the depth multiplied by the number of lines multiplied by 13, all in microseconds. The frame rate then is the reciprocal of that. Uh, that will be the frame rate in hertz. So as an example, I can put in five centimeters for D, 200 lines for N, and we would get a frame rate of 77 hertz if we put that in. Um, modern ultrasound scanners overcome this restriction by forming more than one image line with a single pulse, although that is at the expense of resolution. That could send the frame rate up even higher than 77 hertz. But life isn't as good as that. In fact, the frame rate has to come back down again 
it decreases because we have to focus the sound beam, and I'll explain how that's done later, but the more transmit focal zones that we put in, or some image processing that improves the image display quality, known as compound imaging, that I will also explain, if you use those, that reduces the frame rate again, and um, could be quite a lot. You could easily reduce the frame rate by a factor of 10 if you used all of these image improvement techniques. And I'll display, I would describe some of that when we have the hands-on demonstration. I will show you how uh, the frame rate gets reduced by switching in image improvement properties. How do we generate those sound pulses that travel into the tissue? It's done with a piezoelectric transducer. And piezoelectric is just a word that means that if we apply a voltage across a crystal, then it will change its thickness. And that change in thickness, if we do it rapidly enough, means that we can expand and compress the tissue adjacent, uh, that is adjacent to this transducer element or we can contract it and decrease the pressure adjacent to the transducer element. So if we apply a voltage spike, that will happen very quickly, and it will oscillate in thickness like this, and therefore the pressure adjacent there in the tissue will do the same thing, and then that pressure wave will travel, as I described in the first movie. A typical ultrasound transducer inside has that sort of piezoelectric element um, with electrodes on front and back connected to cables that allow that voltage excitation to be applied. And in front, it would have a lens that is an acoustic lens of different acoustic refractive index, in other words, a different speed of sound to the tissue, so that the sound wave can be bent and focused but that's in one plane and another plane, the transducer is divided up into tiny elements. You can see this rubber lens here that I've cut away from a transducer that I took. It was an old transducer that was no longer working, so I you know, dismantled it so that you can see what's inside it. And that's the rubber lens that you can see here, but along this direction, you can see lots of tiny, tiny strips these are microns in size. And real ultrasound transducers look like that when you take them apart. And each one of these can, uh, can generate its own little sound wave. And that allows computer control of each of these elements to focus the sound beam along this direction. And we will talk about how that's done. So you can generate short pulses and narrow sound beams, the beam width here, and a pulse length here. And this means then, if you wanted to see this target, if this was scattering the sound back to the transducer and you wanted to put that on the image, that sound beam would be directed towards that uh, object. If there were another scattering object over here, it would not send sound back to this transducer in this position, and you would not see it. You would have to move the sound beam over to this position to be able to see that target. And that's why we do scanning. So that scattering or reflection that I've just mentioned, it's when an ultrasound wave encounters a change in the compressibility that determines the speed of sound, or the density that determines the speed of sound. Either of those would cause some of the energy to be reflected. For soft tissue structures, most of the energy travels further into the tissue after reflection so that it can be reflected by other structures that are even deeper. Size of the interface relative to the wavelength determines the characteristics of the reflected en energy. So, for example, if it were a very large flat interface, a large quantity of the sound would be reflected back compared to if it were a small, tiny reflector. Also, if that large interface is at an angle, that reflected energy goes off in a different direction. So one property of large, flat interfaces is that the 
energy reflected depends strongly on the angle of the interface. And if it went off in this direction, we would not detect it and not be able to display it on the image. So it's very important for large flat interfaces that we are at 90 degrees to the interface so that the energy comes back to the transducer. Different interfaces reflect different amounts of energy. So an interface between um, water and muscle or water and liver or other properties determine the amount of energy reflected. But it's generally very small. Typically between different types of soft tissues, you have only about 1% of the energy reflected, even for a large flat interface that is at 90 degrees. Um, bone and air are different, and they have such different properties in density or compressibility that they reflect a large amount of the energy, 50% in case of the interface between bone and soft tissue, and air and soft tissue, nearly 100% of the energy gets reflected. And this is the reason we need coupling gel between the transducer and the body. If you don't apply that, air that's trapped in between the transducer and the body will mean that you get almost no sound transmitted from the transducer into the body because it's all reflected at the transducer air interface. But it also means this is the reason why we can't get good ultrasound images beyond bone or beyond air. Uh, bowel gas, things like that, if you're scanning the abdomen. And we can't image effectively deep into the thorax unless we have acoustic windows to see the heart through um, uh, subcostal or supersternal uh, and places like that. If the scatterers are very tiny, individual cellular scatterers, for example, um, then the sound gets reflected in all directions. And it doesn't matter which direction the sound is coming from and being reflected back. So the angle dependence isn't there, which is good, but these scatterers are so small that the interaction, the interaction with the sound beam is tiny. And so therefore, a very, very little of the energy comes back. Most of it is wasted going off in different directions. Um, and that's true even for lots and lots of collections of scatterers, um, sort of stochastic scattering, as we say. Uh, instead of a single cell, we have many collections of scale cells uh, or the ultrastructural matrix of tissue, the extracellular matrix, scatters in all directions, blood vessels and so on. So most of the real tissue structure is of this type, but it's very weak scattering. Another property of these ensembles or collections of small scatterers is that they each send back an individual echo and they all combine back at the transducer and they can sum up positively or negatively a little bit like the light that I'm using to point on the screen now, this laser pointer. Um, if you're close to the screen, you can see that red dot shimmering. It's what we call speckle. And that happens with ultrasound as well. You get laser type of speckle. It's ultrasound speckle due to the summing up, either positively or negatively, uh, in a random way of all of these tiny echoes that are coming back. And that generates speckle. And speckle is visible in homogeneous parts of tissue. And the thyroid gland is a nice homogeneous region and is good to illustrate speckle. And if we zoom in on region of this image, you can see the speckle here. It does not relate to the microstructure of the tissue in a one-to-one -one way. Um, if you repeat the scan, you get the same speckle pattern um, if nothing moves, but you can't actually interpret the speckle in terms of anatomy. It's only when you get to the larger scale and some of these regions, such as I'm pointing to there, probably correspond to a blood vessel, that you can start to interpret the anatomy. 
but a lot of the other fine structure here is this speckle, which is a kind of artifact. You can improve that speckle and reduce it and improve your interpretation of what is real and what is false by making compounded images. And that is looking at these tiny scatterers from different directions and summing up the images from different directions. And that's known as angle compounding. And I'll show you some example images of that later. So when we send a sound beam in, it does get scattered, as we've just described, and that scattered energy comes back and we make use of it to form the images. But most of the energy carries on. And in fact, most of the energy ends up being absorbed in the tissue to generate a small amount of heat. We are raising the temperature of the tissue as we do ultrasound scanning. And that's a safety issue, but safety is another whole other lecture um, for the system settings that we provide on the manufacturer of solid scanners. It's not a problem that you need to worry about, but the thermal index and indeed a mechanical index are displayed usually in the top corner of the image. Um, and it's worth remembering that it does do that. It does heat the tissue up a little bit. Um, the main point for image quality is that as that absorption occurs and is transferred to heat in the tissue, the strength of the sound wave is decaying constantly as it travels into the tissue. So the deeper we go, the less signal we get. So the signal is decaying with depth. And this happens more for higher frequencies. The higher the frequency, the more this attenuates, which is a problem because we would like to use higher frequencies to get better resolution. And this gives us a compromise, a trade-off that you as a user must always be thinking about. You must control the frequency and choose the frequency trying to use the highest frequency possible for the best quality images, but you find you can't for deeper tissues or strongly attenuating tissues because the signal is too small at depth to get a good image. It's an unfortunate compromise, but we have to work with it. Now, you can make the images more uniform with depth using a scanner control called swept gain which is simply doing one thing. It's increasing the amplification of the signals with depth. And that renders this type of decreasing signal with depth more like this after time gain compensation or swept gain as it's called. And you get a flat signal with depth. Now what's not shown on here, of course, is there's noise on this signal if we do this, we will also amplify the noise more at depth, and therefore the signal-to-noise ratio is not being improved by this. What is happening is both the signal and the noise are increasing. And eventually, if we go to the depth where there's no signal, then this would all be nothing but noise down here. And you can see that if you play with the scanner, you can show that that is so. There is a choice for how the echoes are put on the screen in terms of brightness. Usually, the stronger the echo amplitude from different interfaces, which you can see here, the brighter the dot on the screen corresponding to that echo interface. But in the system, there is an amplifier and or digital control that adjusts the relationship between the echo amplitude and the displayed image brightness. You might think that it would just be along this red dotted line that one is proportional to the other. But that is not so, because there are some advantages and disadvantages to different relationships. And a perfectly proportional relationship is usually not the best. Usually, we try to compress some of this information by making that relationship look convex like this so that we are amplifying the echoes displayed on the screen more 
when the echoes are small amplitude and less when they're high amplitude. And that relationship then looks like this. Um, and it allows us to get more echo amplitude information on the screen than a linear relationship. Um, and we can adjust this relationship. It's one of the scanner controls. In the hands-on demo, we will play with that control and show what effect it has. It's called the dynamic range control. Um, but an important point that I want to make now is that at low echo amplitudes, this range down here will be translated to quite a big range of image brightness. This means that you, as an observer of the image, can easily distinguish between different echo amplitudes down here. But up here, the same range will be translated as a very small range of brightnesses on the display. So you, as an observer, would find it very difficult to discriminate between different echo amplitudes when they are high. And that's something worth bearing in mind when you're trying to interpret the images um, uh, diagnostically. There are different image formats, but for the breast, mostly you will be using the linear image format. You might be aware that there are other formats, such as the sector image. In the linear image, the beam is just swept linearly across the top of the tissue surface, and all the lines in the image are all parallel to each other. In a sector format, they're all radiating out from a common point back up here. Image resolution is something I've been speaking about, but not explaining. So there are two types of resolution, axial and lateral, in one of these image formats. But there is also another resolution, which is in the direction into the screen, the third dimension. And that is known as the elevational direction, borrowed from radar terminology, this uh, word elevation. We often call it the slice thickness, by analogy to X-ray CT and MRI. Now, axial resolution is down the sound pulse propagation direction. And what we mean by that is that it's the question of how close two echo-producing interfaces can become before they're no longer distinguishable. Similarly, the lateral resolution is across the sound scanning direction, and it's how close can two regions become before they're no longer distinguishable. And just to remind you, high frequency, short wavelength, and short pulse length, or high frequency, short wavelength, and in this case, narrow sound beam produced by focusing, uh, these all produce better resolution. And that's very much saying the same sort of thing. This is uh, focusing the sound beam to produce a narrow beam gives us better resolution. The choice of the probe that you pick up and scan with depends on the structure and depth that you're interested in. A high frequency probe will have better resolution than a low frequency probe, but poorer penetration because of the attenuation increasing with frequency that I described. Um, and so that's the choice between resolution and penetration that you must make. Typical values, you can see abdomen, low frequency, neck or breast, high frequency. Now, for sector scanning, you steer the beam, and this is done electronically. I showed you in the transducer that I took apart that contains many small elements. These are the elements in an example um, diagrammatic transducer. Eight are shown, and you can steer the sound beam by firing the elements sequentially, so that by the time you fire this one, the wave from this one has already reached to this distance. And these wavelets sum up to produce a resultant wavefront that's traveling in this direction. Similarly, you can focus the beam 
by firing the outside elements first and gradually later firing the inside elements. And the resultant beam from summing up all these wavelengths then looks curved. And that curved wavefront then is traveling in this direction, now out near the edge, but straight ahead near the center. And so with time, it collapses to a point down here and then eventually diverges again deeper. And so the beam will be very narrow at the center of curvature of this wave front down here. And you will have yourself a narrow beam width at this point. That will produce an image with very good resolution at that depth. If you want to produce another image with resolution that's very good at a different depth, perhaps up here, you would need to fire a different sound pulse with a different delay profile across this aperture. And that's why you compromise the frame rate if you want more focal zones. Each focal zone that you create needs a different pulse to actually create that focal zone. So that lowers the frame rate because it lowers the number of pulses per line. Here's an example of um, good focusing, poor focusing. What I missed off here is that if you want to be able to curve that wave front correctly, you need to know the speed of sound in the tissue because it's the speed of sound that determines the time it takes for the wavelet from this element to reach this point and this one to reach this point and so on. So that curvature depends on the knowledge of speed of sound. If you get it wrong, the focus will be wrong. And here's an example of that in a urethane phantom chosen deliberately because urethane has a very low speed of sound. And so if you just use a scanner with a urethane phantom without a correction for the speed of sound, and if it thinks it's looking into tissue at 15, 40 meters per second, you end up with point targets displayed with very poor resolution. If you do a correction and make the scanner understand the computer and the scanner know that this is the speed of sound, then the points start to look like that and are displayed with nice fidelity. In the breast, it's somewhat less important because the scanner's getting the speed of sound pretty much right. But it can make small differences, and most modern scanners now do allow you, the high-end scanners, do allow you to make the correction. And if you get it right, your images can look slightly more improved. And it's good confidence, really, to know that you're getting the best focused image and you're not missing anything. Different display formats, I won't spend long on this. You're mainly using the linear array for the linear scan. Uh, but that can be multiple rows of elements, as you can see here. Um, and that would be a one and a half D array that I'll describe in a moment. And in the most modern high expensive scanners, you can get a 2D matrix array that allows focusing um, in plane as well as in the elevation direction electronically. And the advantage of better focusing with multiple rows of elements is that better slice thickness in the elevation direction actually translates into the ability to do uh, better uh, contrast imaging in plane. Because otherwise, if the slice thickness is too big, for example, if you had a cyst that is uh, well seen in the focus, when the focus is set to this depth, then as the beam diverges and you have a bigger slice thickness here, the echoes in the part of the beam that is not present, in the, uh, where the cyst is not present, but there's other tissues here, send echoes back, and you can't see that properly. But if you have the ability to focus uh, electronically and have a narrow slice thickness at all the depths, then you will see this cyst at all depths. So this is a slightly more complicated aspect of the system. It's where resolution and contrast start to interact. And if you want to ask me about this in the break, I can sort of spend more time if you find it difficult to understand. I'm very happy to speak to you 
later and, and explain it uh, slowly. We have spoken about different types of scans, simple linear scan and sector scans. And we've spoken about angle compounding. And angle compounding sums up multiple scans from different directions. It is for reducing speckle or for displaying large scale interfaces where the reflections are going off in different directions because of the angle of the interface more clearly. And you can see a simple scan, simple linear scan of a breast cyst here showing acoustic enhancement, which is a property of the um, attenuation being lower in this region than it is uh, in the rest of the tissue. And you can see these properties very clearly, but you can see there's a lot of speckle in the background glandular tissue. That can be reduced by summing up images from multiple different angles, the angle compounding. And that produces a much smoother image, a speckle reduced image. Um, and you can see the tiny detail present much more clearly. But each one of these different angles that the sound beam is shooting along is another frame. And therefore you're slowing down the scanner by a frame rate in proportion to the number of angles that one is adding up, compounding. Um, we can show that effect in the hands-on demo. It produces a better image, um, but a slightly fuzzier acoustic enhancement. And if this were a solid lesion and this were throwing a shadow, that would be a slightly fuzzier shadow. So there are advantages and disadvantages to using the speckle reduction compounding. It produces better anatomical detail, but it can reduce some of the acoustic signs of benign or malignancy. And it's worth actually, if you have time, to look at both kinds of images. Won't do any harm though if you're leaving the scanner set in the compounded mode. Here's an example of a carcinoma, um, uh, again showing the better tissue detail you see with the compounded image. Another image improvement technique is harmonic imaging and what that's doing is taking advantage of something that happens to the wave which when it starts its life at the tissue surface looks roughly sinusoidal like that. If this is the pressure in the tissue, it's traveling to the right and as it travels, it distorts because the high frequency, the high amplitude part of the wave travels faster than the low amplitude. And that distortion creates different frequency components. And the frequency components, if you look at the spectrum, this is the frequency F naught of the fundamental of the wave. This is here as it's starting. But as it travels, this distortion produces higher frequencies. And if we look at this one, twice the fundamental, this is known as the second harmonic. Now we know that the fundamental its intensity or amplitude would decay with depth due to attenuation. But the harmonic starts life as nothing and grows because of the distortion that's occurring as the wave travels. That increase with depth we can use. And if we set the scanner to exclude this part and just filter out this part, we can make an image with the harmonic only. And what that does, it means that sound that might otherwise reverberate in fat, um, fibrous interfaces near the transducer are ignored because the harmonic hasn't got there yet and the harmonic is only building up as we get deeper. By tuning into the harmonic only, you get cleaner images. This is the fundamental, that's the harmonic. The same in these pairs. And you can see how in these dilated ductal structures, you get a much more cleaner image. And in this uh, small cyst, it now looks more like a cyst rather than a solid lesion, and so on. 
So harmonic imaging can be very valuable. All those controls you can set yourself. On many expensive scanners, you can just press one button and it will automatically set them up for you. Or you can choose the breast imaging preset and it may set most of them for you. In the hands-on demo, we'll play with some of those controls and see what they do. Generally speaking, in a busy clinic, it's worthwhile using those quick setups. But if you've got time, you can always do a better job knowing the physics that I've just explained to you and setting it up yourself. Um, you need to know what the automatic control is doing so when you get a new scanner, spend 10 minutes or so playing with it and understanding what the automatic control is doing so that you know whether it's doing what you want it to do and whether you could do a better job yourself. Um, we can look at that in the hands-on demo, so I won't take more time now to explain that. And I think that's all I have to say. hope that was helpful. <laughs>